everyone. Uh, as you said, my name is Raquel Velez. I'm Rockbot on all of the things. Uh, now, let me just get a general survey of the area. How many of you have ever used NPM? OK, excellent. How many of you have used the NPM website in the last month? Last week? Last day? Use it multiple times a day? OK, yeah, the numbers are dwindling. That's OK. One day, we'll get you using it all the time, forever and ever. We'll be like the next fa No, we're not, we won't. OK. Uh, <laughs> Now, most of my colleagues, when they talk about NPM, uh, they'll talk about the CLI, they'll talk about the registry, but today, y'all are in luck, because I'm going to talk about the website. Uh, so my goal is to kind of give you an overview of NPM in general, uh, then talk about the history of the website, and then I want to talk about the lessons that we have learned in the process of building the website, um, and that, I think, is going to be the coolest takeaway. All right, so NPM in general. Fun fact. NPM does not actually stand for Node Package Manager. When Isaac Schluter created it, it was literally just a three-letter word, NPM. You could say that it has no prescribed meaning. OK. <laughs> Only pun, I promise. OK. Uh, that said, it is actually a package manager for JavaScript, though even that is a little bit misleading, because there are over 350,000 packages on NPM right now. And uh, many of them, while many of them are JavaScript based, there are ones with CSS in them, and ones with Go and Rust, and there's even a little bit of C in there. So, really, it's just a package manager. I like to think it's pretty cool. And so, you may know that it started out as an open source project. Node came around in 2009, and that was really great. And people wanted to share code, but they wanted to really use it as like modules and add those little modules into their websites or their applications. And so Isaac Schluter, our CEO, created NPM as you know, just a kind of cool thing. And that was fantastic, except something interesting happened. People started using Node a lot. And with it, they started using NPM a lot. This is the graph of people installing Node modules uh, in, over the course of the first four years of NPM's existence. But not only were they using NPM, they were also really contributing to the NPM ecosystem. Right? This is exponential. Like, this is not what you expect in general. Now, there was a dark period at the end of 2013. In those days, we call it the dark period because NPM kept going down. How many of you used NPM in 2013? Do you remember those days? They were kind of dark. Uh, people were relying on Node and NPM in production. And then all of a sudden, they couldn't use NPM because the growth was so exponential and so massive that this tiny open source project could not handle the load. There was no dedicated people, no real dedicated servers. So it went dark a lot. At that point, Isaac made the decision to turn NPM into a company because we wanted to be able to create products and services to give real user value to the point where you wanted to pay money so that we could keep the registry up and running and we could pay people to keep the registry, the registry up and running. So that's how NPM kind of started. And uh, in 2014, I became the first employee of NPM. And the entire existence of my time at NPM has been focused on the website. So let's go a little bit back in time. Uh, the very first version of the NPM website is from June 2010. And here's what it looked like. It was just a little landing page. There's not much here. It's just a little like, hey, there's this thing called NPM. Go to the GitHub repo. You'll find out more information there. Great. Six months later, though, there's a little bit more information. Again, it's still really more of a landing page. But one really fun addition is this idea of searching for packages. This is what the search looked like. Anybody who used this back then, this is like a nostalgic, nostalgic sort of moment. Uh, this was a couch app created by Michael Rogers. And when you only have like a few hundred packages, this is fine. This is totally fine. It was, in fact, it was so fine, it worked for 18 months. Uh, then something really big happened. NPM became packaged with Node. And while that in and of itself for the website is not that big of a deal, it does actually mean that there are more users, which means more user growth. And a few months after that, 
the first real community was, was born on the NPM website. So this really allows us to not only search packages, but to start seeing people's profiles and start getting statistics about, about packages and who's building stuff and, and how many people are downloading it. And, and it was so cool. Now, the thing about the search, though, is that the number of packages started to skyrocket, and Michael's little couch app didn't quite work anymore. Uh, and so it actually turned out that you would go to the little search input, and it would just take you to Google. It was like, forget it. We're not going to be able to do this. But eventually, somebody added an Elasticsearch engine, and we had really, really basic search. I am sad to say that this is still the exact same Elasticsearch engine that we're using on npmjs.com right now. That's why the search sucks. We're working on it, I promise. OK, great. So after that point, for the next two and a half years, we started this company. We started really getting into the website. But something very, very, very important, really important happened in June 2014. We got a wombat. Uh, <laughs> we got our first mascot, and this is our, really our only mascot. Uh, but you know, it's really cute and cuddly, and a lot of people ask me, what is the origin of the wombat? Where does this come from? Now, if you'll allow me a moment of embarrassment, this is the real story of why we have a wombat as our mascot. Turns out that there was an intern who was complaining one day about slow internet. And I, don't, I have no idea what compelled me. I have no clue at all. But Basically, here's what I said. The internet is a series of tubes, which we all know is a fact. Sometimes things get clogged, and sometimes there is a leak. Because tubes can be broken. There is no fix except to release a pack of wombats with pickaxes and little helmets and bright orange vests for safety. I have no idea where this came from. It just came out of nowhere. Now, CJ Silverio, who uh, started a week after me, Sheep chimes in with Wombat Developers Union for the win. I don't know where that came from either. But see, here's the fun thing. If you take the NPM logo and you invert it, it's WDU. So boom, of course, obviously, we should be the Wombat's Developer Union. <laughs> so uh, if you love our Wombat, shout out to It's John Q on Twitter, because I just one day was like, OK, hey, Twitter, who can draw me a Wombat in a ninja suit? And John Quatch came in and just drew this cute little thing, and we were like, done. It's over. Game over. We love our little wombat. This is the greatest. So now you all know the story. Back to the website. OK. So two and a half years go by, and uh, actually, not two and a half years. The next, it was several years later, uh, from the last time we saw our website, uh, <laughs> we spent time and we, we put out a brand new website. We were really focused now, now that the community was growing so much, our major focus was to build a website centered around the community. We wanted to make it as easy as possible to find good packages, to connect with others, and just give you a really nice, beautiful experience. I love the old website, but I like this one better. Uh, <laughs> now, in the process, we also changed a whole bunch of backend stuff, and I'm going to dive into that in a moment. So here's where we are today. Uh, over the last 18 months, we have released three products on our website. And it's really important for us to, to help tell you what they are. So we've got marketing pages now. And we are really just trying to push these products and services because the last thing we ever want ever again is for you to not be able to depend on NPM. When you're doing your installs, it is really important that those servers do exactly what you want. So we got to sell you stuff. OK, great news. Users are increasing on the website. This is great. But did you know that we're doing it with a team of three? There's only three of us working on the web team at NPM. There's only 24 of us at NPM entirely. So there's all of y'all, and then there's just a couple of us. <laughs> so, but we all work together, and that's really important. OK, let's get into the nitty gritty, meaty bits. So over the course of the last two and a half years, I have had the wonderful privilege of working on the NPM website. And I have learned a ton of things. I cannot go over every single thing that we learned, but here are some kind of really high-level highlights. When we, very, when we first started NPM, uh, I started on the first day. A week later, my coworker CJ 
started. And I'm sitting there just frantically trying to figure out, OK, I just need to put stars in the website. Let me add Ajax. Like, there was no JavaScript in the, in the original version of the, of the web app. And CJ comes in, and she's like, OK, we are going to add metrics and logging immediately. And I was like, why would we do that? That makes no sense. Right now, our servers keep falling over. Our community is really upset with us. We need to build stuff fast. Well, there's a reason why CJ is now the CTO, and I've only made my way up to engineering manager, uh, because it turns out that metrics give you the information that you didn't know you needed. Metrics tell you what your users and what your systems are doing. Because while you can guess what they're doing, you can't actually know with real hard data until you start adding metrics. Logs allow you to basically record those metrics and search them later. So those two things really come hand in hand for you to really understand what the heck is going on. And let me tell you, the sooner you do it, the easier it is to continue doing it, and you'll have all of that data from the beginning. The worst thing is when product comes in and says, hey, so we have this idea. What do you think? And you're like, mm. um, when you have the actual data, that's when you can really kind of push forward and say, yes, this is a great idea, or no, our users are never going to want to do this. I'm going to say something a little bit you know, interesting, but I'm going to give it to you from a different angle. At some point, so the original website that Isaac built, it was a hand-rolled uh, just kind of framework that he built on his own. And it was fine, except for the part where when I needed to come on, to, on board, it took me six months to figure out how it all worked. And that was really difficult. So we decided to scrap it all entirely and start from scratch. Now, when you're starting a app from scratch, there are so many options, so many opportunities. And honestly, it doesn't matter which one you choose, or if you even choose one at all. Uh, at the, ultimately, the, it comes down to the fact that your framework, if you choose one, OK, let me, let me phrase it this way. There is no one framework to solve every single problem. Never, ever, ever. It's important, if you're going to pick a framework, to pick one that suits your needs specifically. So assess what your needs are, and then focus on that. I don't care which one you choose, if at all. That said, use a framework. Please use a framework. When you're in an early stage startup, you don't have time to be making a billion and seven decisions, right? And let me tell you, if you have 20 engineers in a room, you're going to have 50 different opinions on how things should be done, right? Like, we all know this. A framework gives you the opportunity to let somebody else make those decisions, let someone else have the opinions, and everyone else just kind of fall in line. Because you have to get product out. You don't have to sit there fighting about whether or not you should have semicolons or callbacks or promises or what. You don't need that on your, on your plate. You just don't. Uh, that said, we ultimately decided to use HappyJS for our backend framework. If you want to know why I, we chose Happy over, say, something like Express, let's talk about that afterwards. But that was a decision that we made. Uh, similarly, for our front end, we haven't implemented a front end framework yet, but we're thinking about which one we're going to go with. Ultimately, again, it doesn't matter which one you choose, but it does matter that you pick something and stick with it. The absolute worst thing you can ever do is implement a framework into your app and then either not use it at all or fight it. If you find yourself fighting your framework, just stop. Get rid of your framework and pick a new one that will actually work with what you need. As the, website, as the web team started to grow, an interesting thing started happening. Because at first, I was the only one working on the website. It was great, right? Because I had everything in my brain. I knew everything that I needed to know, every decision that was made, all of it. The whole code base was in my head at all times. But then an interesting thing happens when you, when you bring someone else new to, to you, the team, right? It's suddenly like you have this whole arche archaeological dig site. You can see all the decisions that were made, but you'll never know why they were made. You, you can see what was done but you'll never understand what were the things that led up to those decisions. So ultimately, people would come and be like, why, why are we doing it this way? And I would look at them like, well, isn't it obvious? And they'd be like, no, there's no documentation. This one function isn't tested at all. There's nothing here. So 
that was a huge moment for me to realize that in order to get people to be in, to understand what's going on in this code base, we had to implement some new processes. That meant more pair programming. And even more importantly, whenever we get new things from product, we actually sit down and, and, and have a discussion about what decisions we should be making. And that was super critical and so valuable because now everybody's on the same page at the same time. As you're, building your, as you're writing your code and you're building your app, there is this moment when you know you need to push to production, but you're probably a little nervous. So why? Why are you a little nervous? Well, it's probably because you're not as confident in your code as you really want to be. Ultimately, this comes down to testing, right? You know that you can put stuff out when, when it's really good quality code. When you trust your code, that means you are happy to let it go out into production. When I first started, when this team first started, we thought, OK, you know what? Unit tests. Let's just focus on the unit tests, because any testing is better than no testing at all, for sure. But about, it got to the point where we'd throw things up into staging, and while all the individual pieces of code worked just fine, the integration points didn't. And why was that? Well, we didn't have any integration tests, so it, it was impossible for us to know, because we, we mocked out all of our API calls in our unit tests. So it, we had no idea. We did not realize that the actual API calls from our external APIs, the, the stuff that was coming out of there was not, was not matching what we were expecting. So eventually, we did put in integration tests. I want to make a huge shout out to Nemo.js. Uh, they're made by the folks at PayPal. It is the best wrapper around Selenium I have ever seen. So if you're, if you're sitting there going, eh, I don't know about integration tests, Nemo.js, I promise. It's worth your time. Now, speaking about trust, NPM's ethos is all about the many small modules. We love small modules. They, they make code easier to write. They make your code stronger and better. But ultimately, there is that one tiny caveat, which is that you didn't necessarily always write all of those little modules. So you have to trust the people who created them in the first place. But what happens when that trust is slightly broken? We had an incident where we implemented, we created a brand new markdown parser, and we added it to the website. And that was super, super great, because it was beautiful and it worked fast, except for whatever reason, every 36 hours or so, our website would just go down. It would crash, because there was a massive memory leak. We had no idea why. It took us six months before, before we, we actually sat down and just went through line by line, figured out where this memory leak was. It turns out that within our markdown dependency, there was a dependency that was a dependency of another dependency that had a memory leak in some C++ code. And they had never seen that leak because nobody was using that, that one tiny module at the scale that we were. So, we found this leak, and the beauty of open source is that we found the leak, we put in, we put in a pull request, and then using the beauty of Semver, just kind of like worked our way back up, memory leak, gone, push it out to production, fantastic, everything is fine again. But you do have to trust. That is, that is a big thing. I totally trust all of it. Just, you know, OK, cool. <laughs> now, the fun thing about working on a website is that you really bring an entire company together, right? Everybody loves working on the website. Everybody has an opinion about what should be on the website. And that's because for a lot of companies, the website is your one opportunity to interact with the user base. NPM is interesting because we have a CLI, and that's where all of our users interact with us. But our marketing team, and our support team, and our docs team, they all need to use, they all need to talk to you some way, somehow. And that's in addition to all the products that we're building. So one of the biggest difficulties we had early on, and actually even still to this day, is figuring out how to really prioritize all of the different requirements and needs, which are all valid, in a way that we can really push everything out the door. Especially given that we have such a tiny, tiny team, the fact that everybody wants their say on how the website should look or act or feel, it can be really overwhelming. So we, started, we did two things. And like I said, it's a work in progress. But the first thing we did was 
we started adding some kind of project management, some product management, to get people to kind of line up and say, OK, here are the major things that we need to, to accomplish. And that's been really helpful because it allows us to kind of put into perspective, OK, this is the next thing that we need to accomplish. Everybody's on board. Cool. But the other thing that we did from a technical side is we started breaking the website down. It's a massive monolith at the moment, but we're starting to break it down into different microservices, which will allow individual teams at NPM to kind of take over their own personal piece. So for example, the marketing team will have their own kind of marketing service that you as the user won't ever actually notice any difference, but at least what that means is the marketing team can go ahead and push out the code they need whenever they want without having to incur the three-person team, three team bottleneck. Now, probably the hardest lesson that we've learned in the last two and a half years uh, comes down to this. When Isaac first started NPM, he did everything in open source, and it was fantastic. It was really, really, really wonderful. In fact, all of us who joined NPM, especially on the engineering team, we were super ecstatic because how great is it to have somebody else pay you to work on open source? Like, that is just the coolest thing ever. No more nights and weekends. This is your day job. And it was great. But then something happened. We had to get stuff out the door. We had to move on product. Our team was too small. We didn't have any bandwidth or the people or the time to really focus on the user community. So people would put in pull requests and issues, and we were like, OK, well, let's get to this. But then another thing happened, which is that the registry team decided to break out the registry into lots of different microservices, which was great. It made us move a lot faster internally, but it meant that our user base couldn't replicate the website locally because all of these services were private and everything like that. And it was just suddenly you could clone the repo, but you couldn't actually do anything with it. And so people would put in issues, and they'd be like, hey, I think, I think this is wrong, but I don't know because I can't replicate it. But maybe you could do it for us? And it's like, we don't have the time to do that. Oh, gosh, this is really bad. And it just kind of kept building up and building up, and it was kind of terrible. And at the same time, we had this situation where uh, because our, our, our repo was open source, at the time, like we've been using Travis continuous integration for the last year and a half or so, and it's been fantastic. At the time, uh, the, if you have a public repo, you end up in the same queue as all the other public repos, which sometimes meant that even if it was a massive security bug fix, it could take up to an hour, maybe two, to get our build to go. That's not acceptable for a production-level website. So we did a little experiment. We, we went ahead and we made a private fork of the website just to see what happens. Well, first of all, the Travis builds went, the, the timing went down super, it was super fast, right? So great, we can move forward and we can move really quickly. But then another thing happened. Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed that we made a private fork of, of everything. Like, the public open source version of our website was stale for months. And there were maybe two people who were like, hey, wait a second, this doesn't quite look right. But I'm talking two out of all of our users. That was, it was kind of like, well, so at this point, it kind of just feels like just a view source button, which it was really awesome uh, talking to Miles the other night. He, he talked about open source versus view source, and I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant idea. But that was basically what we were doing. We were just kind of showing off our website, but we couldn't let anybody really comment on it or work with it or play with it. And so we made the really tough decision to go ahead and just shut it down. Um, that's hard. It's really hard. Believe me, there was a lot of angry people internally to the company. There were a lot of discussions that were very heated discussions that happened because of it. Now, the way that we've mollified it is that in the process of taking our monolithic app and breaking it down into smaller pieces, we're open sourcing the tiny modules, right? And those are a lot easier to maintain because it's 30 lines of code. There's a pull request. Great. And it's easy to see and easy to test, and it's fantastic. So that was rough, but it happened. Now, through all of this, we have learned a ton of lessons, right? We've made a bunch of mistakes, we've made some really good decisions, and we've made a ton of progress and just 
change this website so much. But ultimately, no matter what mistakes we made, no matter what decisions we made, at the end of the day, we're going to make more mistakes and we're going to make more decisions. And it's just going to continue cycling because change is inevitable. As we move forward, as we continue learning, we're going to, get, we're going to learn yet even more. And ultimately, personally, I want to thank you all for giving us that opportunity because honestly, it's because of all of our users that we continually want and strive to change. And it's because of you who use these products and services that we are desperate to get out that we can continue to maintain this wonderful ecosystem and really build up this community in every other way that we possibly can. So with that, huge, huge, huge thanks. It's great to be here. Um, I have a few pairs of socks. Um, what do you mean? I'm not bribing you to be my friends. Uh, so if you would like to maybe procure one of these, uh, come hang out with me and ask me questions. And uh, let's talk about NPM, and let's talk about the website or the CLI or anything. I want to hear your opinions. I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, that matters a lot to me. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>